This thing's gigantic. This is the Dragon Slayer. This is a sword belonging to a protagonist in a manga and anime named Guts. It was more like a large hunk of... Okay, I know I called it a sword. I'm probably going to call it a sword a lot in this video. I understand what was quoted in the manga and the anime that it's a big hunking heap of iron, but in my opinion, it has a handle, it has a blade, it's a sword, but I get it, I understand it, don't comment. And if you've ever seen Berserk, you'll recognize this instantly. First off, I wanna say, I'm, I don't wanna to pander to absolutely anybody here. I've never read the manga, I've never seen the anime, and I'm not gonna do a bunch of half-hearted research trying to lie to you guys about, oh, hey, look at this, or make some witty quotes or anything like that. This was sent to me, the design, or the suggestion at least, was sent to me by a fan on Instagram. Uh, thanks, Willie J, I really appreciate it. And I've heard about Berserk, I've heard about the anime. Um, if you've ever watched um, Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans, uh, Akihiro in it is always called Space Guts. He's a very simple protagonist from what I've gathered. And he has a really big ass sword. He's called the, uh, the Black Swordsman, I believe. Um, I did a little bit of research, but not enough to where I'm just gonna try to lie to you guys. This sword is cool. I'm a very big fan of large swords. I have a buster sword sitting up here. I, I just like big weapons like this. They're really cool, they're really intimidating. And I've always seen glimpses and images of this weapon. And I'm like, okay, you know what? When he sent that to me, I'm like, I want that. So I hopped on CG Trader, I found this file, and I was like, oh, yeah, we can do that. We're gonna build that. And I'm really glad I did. Now, don't get me wrong, I do plan to go and watch the anime. I just don't have time for the manga, even if it might be better or worse. Uh, usually they're better. But this is a really cool weapon, and I'm really glad I made it. So I wanna kinda talk you guys through how I made it, what I did, the pitfalls I ran into. But it's going to be, a, again, a little bit less of a tutorial than normal because I didn't record the whole process because sometimes I just kind of like building stuff um, and I don't really like to be weighed down by having to record every process. Granted, I did get a little carried away on this thing. Um, once the ball started rolling, I really just worked to finish it and now we're here. So I definitely want to take you guys through some of the, uh, the little bits and uh, issues I ran into, how I was able to reinforce it so I could actually hold it out properly because what is a sword like this if you can't actually hold it and wield it and pose with it properly? It's just, you know, it's just a prop at that point and that's just no fun. So let's get started. So when you receive the files, you're going to notice that the sword is cut into about 10 pieces, roughly. And these are going to be all the pieces you're going to need to actually print and assemble it. And, but since they're pre-cut, you might run into a little bit of a problem where, all right, uh, this isn't how I wanted to cut it, or I wanted to cut it a different way, or how can I rebuild this and cut it the way you want? So you can probably search all day finding a different STL, but this is the one I went with. And if you start dropping things in th um, Slicer, you'll notice that it's gonna auto align and it's gonna auto hone them, which isn't always ideal because you wanna see how the sword or weapon is gonna be uh, assembled. But there's a cool little trick I want to show you guys to get a better grasp on what you're going to be dealing with. And all you have to do, and you go up to File, you go to Preferences, and you remove the Auto Align feature. Now, I've showed you this in a couple other videos, but I'm going to re-show you again. Now, what this is going to do, as long as the uh, coordinates in the 3D space are saved, it's actually going to slowly rebuild exactly where they were separated and modeled. So you can actually use this to rebuild weapons and props to get a better feel on what they're gonna look like, how they're gonna be aligned, and you can slowly rebuild the entire thing. And this will give you a good uh, dimensionality, a good size. So now I have the entire sword sitting here in Slicer to get a better look at it. Now, if I wanted to, and I didn't try it, but I could export the STL and see if it fuses everything together. And I did this, I did the measurements and was able to scale everything up to see how it actually looked at 100%. And I actually ended up scaling this up to 110% because after doing some math, and looking at everything and realizing, okay, cool, uh, it's a little bit shorter than the uh, the cannon, so I actually went and scaled it up. It, it measures roughly 1.9 meters um, canonically, and it varies between six six foot two inches to six foot five inches. So I scaled it up, and you can actually go up into uh, scale and slicer, and this is actually down to 16%. And if we go up to 110, it actually kicks it up to 1980 millimeters. And this is the size that I actually went with. And we have the full sword here now. So if the here, from here, if you wanted to, 
you could go through and actually start making your own cuts and slicing it up however you want to fit on whatever bed you're gonna be printing it on. There we go, we can actually cut this apart and leave it or you know edit this to get a better view of everything. And from here, you can actually start chopping it up and sizing it up and seeing, all right, this is what I wanna do or print. And in hindsight, I kinda wish I had done this and given it my own cuts and messed with it instead of actually relying on the program, uh, the modeler himself to uh, align it. Uh, I think I would've gotten a little bit of a better quality out of it if I had just printed the parts bigger but I wanted to test out the model and kind of see how everything came out. So feel free to cut this however you deem necessary and however it fits your bed. If you wanna make more accurate cuts, um, I definitely recommend maybe Mesh Mixer. It'll give you better angles. But for the time being, I wanna actually go and review how we actually were able to fit this on my normal bed. And I printed some of this on my CR-10S. I printed some of this on my Ender 5 Plus. Uh, let me show you some of the pieces actually on the Ender 3. So as you can see, these are pretty big pieces and uh, they are definitely gonna take up some room especially since I scaled it up to be a little bit more accurate. So if we actually pump this up to 110 and we center it, you can see just how much bigger this is than the bed. And even if I try to align it and mess with everything, I could probably play around with this for a little bit and might be able to just get it to fit. It's gonna be a very, very risky print that uh, I, I don't know if I would trust. Um, this is again, maxing out your Ender 3. It does look like it might barely fit with a little bit of play. I think it's just because my rafts are on, but if I get rid of adhesion and I start playing with things like that, I might be able to get it in there. That'd be kind of cool actually. So we'll move this down. Hey, so it does fit. So this is just gonna be an absolute massive print for your Ender and uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's risky. So this is definitely up to you if you wanna do something like this. If you were to print it at the standard 100% 100, 100 uh, 100 scale, it might fit better and you have less risk and worry, but this is just, this is a lot of big prints for um, this tiny printer and it's gonna use a buttload of filament. So we're gonna pretend we have, everybody has a CR-10S and it's a perfect world and no one's using the Ender for these big prints. But there's a few things I wanna talk about. The, uh, mainly this peg system at the top. Now this peg system is pretty cool. Uh, I do have to admit that. However, the dimensional accuracy of my prints isn't what it should be. And what I mean by that is, for these pegs to actually fit in the next part, these slots to actually fit in the part above it or below it that it's supposed to, and you can see here, your printer needs to be pretty well and dialed in. Uh, my dimensional accuracy is off a little bit because typically I don't do prints that are this form fitting and this perfectly fitting. So I actually can't, wasn't able to get them to fit in there properly once I printed them. And the reason for this is just, again, a little bit of over extrusion. My edges weren't perfect. It, it was it was modeled. Um, it, it should have been dropped down a little bit to give a little wiggle room. Now you could sand the edges down. You could uh, cut them, melt them. You could do whatever. What I actually ended up doing was breaking all of these off. After I printed them and realized that the slots weren't fitting properly, I ended up cutting all of the slots and pegs off and straight plastic welding it all the way through. Now, if you printed this at a very high infill, these pegs would work, but again, that's still just plastic that you're trusting to itself, and I never trust that. I always plastic weld. So I got rid of these completely, plastic welded all of it in, and it, it seems to be working just fine for me. Now, all of these parts, I did print them in a little bit of a gradient. I actually went and printed the first couple parts. Now you see how you have the handle, which is parts one and two, which is the handle and the little hilt at the bottom. These were printed at about a 15%, um, except the cap, I think that was 5%. But I printed the handle at about uh, a 10% to 15% infill. I believe it was 15 because I ended up running a metal rod through this. Now this model was only made to lock um, into itself in one shot. What I did was I actually dropped the handle into Mesh Mixer and you need to play around with this because right now this handle is sitting here at 100% scale. And if I go and make a tube or channel through it and scale it up, that, that tube is also gonna go up with it. So what you could do is drop this into Cura or Slicer, change it to the proper scale, export the STL, and then you have your 100% scaled STL that you wanna mess with. And the first thing I wanna do is I'm actually going to go ahead and generate the face groups just so I can see all the edges and corners of this. And this is just gonna show me, you know, what the faces look like, where the edges are. And I'm gonna go ahead and add a tube. Now, again, there could be better ways to do this. This is the way that uh, I figured out how to do, and I'm pretty happy with it. So I want my tube, um, my tube type to be on the inside because that's where it's gonna make the tube. I'm gonna leave it on Boolean. And then I want to actually do this in the Z axis. You're gonna have to figure out what axis works for you. 
And then as you drag this around to the different face groups, so I'm gonna to try to center this on this face group right here. And then the other circle is gonna come all the way to the other side. And this is, as you can see, it's moving the tube around to how far I want it to go in. And this doesn't need to go all the way through. You can stop it at different points. So definitely play around with this. And I'm gonna do my best to center this. And you can kind of see there's a little bit of a gradient here that's actually helping me pick out what center is. Now again, if there's a better way to do this, please do it. Uh, I'm still learning really how to modify and mess with these types of things. Um, I'm no expert by any means, but this worked out perfectly for me and I'm pretty happy with the results. So now that tube is going directly through the handle and from there I can adjust the radius. So I want the radius to be eight millimeters and then you hit enter and then that'll actually give you the proper radius. But remember, this is radius, not diameter. So this is gonna be the, from the center to the edge. So if I want like an eight millimeter rod, I'm gonna to have to run a four millimeter radius, giving me an eight millimeter diameter. And this is actually exactly what I did. However, I'm telling you guys to do this because I forgot I cut the cylinder, then exported it and scaled it up. So the, uh, the eight millimeter metal rod I had going through it was a little bit too small. So just be careful in the order you do things. And then once you hit accept, it's gonna go ahead and cut a hole and you just modified an STL and it's actually pretty easy to do. Um, you can do this to make peg systems. You can do this for a lot of things. And there's tons of tutorials on Mesh Mixer that even I myself have been watching um, and trying to learn more about it. But this is a very simple way to add a hole. And then from here, you can just go ahead, export the STL. And then in the end, that'll give you two handles that you can then print on something even like an Ender 3. Now, like I said, this is the uh, eight, eight millimeter diameter hole I cut. So then when I went and actually scaled it up to 110%, the hole actually got bigger with it and I just, I didn't think about it till I printed it. It's not the end of the world, but uh, it just makes the rod a little bit wobbly in there, but it still gives me the strength I needed for it. So that's how I added the hole in there. And you can go through the whole sword and do this, or you can print off the peg system just like, just like I did initially and then weld it together. So from there, everything prints pretty straightforward. I don't think I really needed any supports on anything. The handles printed very simply. I just had to stand them up. Um, they fit perfectly on my uh, CR-10S. With room to spare, you can cut it into thirds, you can cut it into however you need to. The rest of the blade, again, was pretty straightforward to print. I really didn't have any problems with this at all. Um, I personally like to align things on my X axis, and what I mean by that is when the printer is going, my Z gantry, or my, uh, my X gantry is gonna move left and right. This stops my bed from wobbling in and out. So as you get taller prints and as they get closer to the top, they don't wobble in and out and back and forth the whole time. And I've been, I, it helps me reduce the layer lines and the amount of sway and wobble I get at the top of prints. Now, if you're printing this on something like a, um, an Ender 5 Plus um, or a faux Core XY or even a real Core XY, that you're not really gonna have this problem because the bed lowers. But if you're using a, a moving bed platform, like any of the CR10 variants, then you wanna take this into consideration or you can um, orient it along the Y axis, which I see people do, and they get you know similar results. So just play around with this and know what you're getting yourself into. The only part that was a little odd for me to print and that actually didn't come out properly was the very base of the handle or the, the sword itself. And it was actually this chain link that was modeled in, into the bottom. And you can see it right down here. It wants to print this chain link in place. Mine failed, unfortunately. That's why I actually went and added a little metal chain link um, that's on there currently, but I am gonna go back and make it beefier and probably try to print this out. So you could try to slice this off. If I was able to align this really nicely in slicer, I could probably get rid of this and delete the face group, but, or you could try to print it and see if yours comes out. So it will try to support it in there and uh, maybe running a tree support wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. This way you can get, you can actually break them out properly. So just be cognizant of that. If it fails, it really won't ruin the whole print. You'll just have a little bit of spaghetti down here and it's really, it's not the end of the world. So for the base of the blade, I actually ended up printing these at about a 10% gyroid infill. And then as I climbed more towards the top of the blade, I think I did the first section and the second section in about a 15% infill. And then from there, I went to a 10 and then I went to a five to help distribute the weight better. I didn't need the very tip of the sword having a really solid 15% infill when I knew the gyro was strong enough and it's not supporting any weight. So go ahead and pump these out however you deem necessary. And they all printed really nice. Um, the quality was really great, especially with all this texture. I was able to run just a pretty standard um, quality and I was able to get really good detail out of the blade or out of the, uh, the textured part because it does very well at hiding the layer lines when you have this much detail in something. Uh, it's really, it wasn't a problem at all. And then we obviously we sanded down the blade 
so the layer lines right there were hidden all by themselves. So after I got these printed, I went into the garage and I'm gonna show you guys some footage um, from when I actually uh, was welding it together and painting it and sanding it and getting everything all pretty. So let's take a look at that. So I've got everything printed and welded up. Uh, you guys should know how to weld by now uh, with my PLA welding tutorial. This is a little bit of a weird one. Unfortunately, I, I printed it on my CR-10S's and they had a little bit of lifting. So you can see where here the seams lined up beautifully, but I had to go and fill in. And I wish I had taken a picture of it, I'm sorry. Um, I just was kind of aggravated. So I actually went in and filled all this in with um, some leftover um, filament and just extra waste. And it wasn't too bad, but Literally just, you know, almost like with a 3D pen, just kind of melting and filling everything in. Um, I used pieces of tape to kind of line everything up. And just like my buster sword, what I did is there, it's everything's concave. And what I mean by that is that there's actually a little bit of a, of a dip in here because I'm actually gonna go through and use uh, just wood filler to build this back up. Because if I try to go and plastic weld it and constant and build up the plastic sanding it is just way too hard it's really um, harsh on the area because it'll it can start to blow out the walls around it while you're trying to cut this down so it's better to leave it recessed and then just fill it with some uh, wood filler and that's exactly what I'm gonna do but I'm gonna give it a layer of primer first to see exactly where all the imperfections are because even though it's recessed like this actually feels pretty smooth um, and I had a couple print failures as you can see not everything's uniform here, these are all solid pieces, and I had a filament change here, so that was pretty easy. But then this part failed right here. Uh, unfortunately, we had a little bit of a power outage, and um, it was on a printer that didn't have print resume, no biggie. So I had to go and print the rest of this. But when you have an issue like that, where a, you have a print, when you have a print failure, and you need to weld, obviously there's no top layer to this. So I had to actually make sure to fill in and really weld this. I wouldn't have been too concerned if it was near the top, but it's literally the second um, section of the blade. So this is gonna take a lot of weight. And you know, I, I want it to actually be nice and sturdy, and trust me, it is. I already have the uh, handle cap and the actual handle uh, built and primed. You can see where I actually had cut it in half and welded it. Again, it, this is a little bit better example where it's, uh, where it's recessed. And I'm just gonna go and fill that with wood filler. But this smoothed out really nicely. Again, I just used my palm sander and knocked it all down. Um, and then this is the metal rod that actually travels through the entire blade and through the entire the entire handle for rigidity. And the two last things I want to touch on before I actually go and prime this, um, this is obviously textured right here. So I was only able to knock it down a little bit. That's why my welds here were just so crucial. We're gonna see how they come out once I prime it. But uh, I was I just scuffed it up a little bit. Obviously I can't cut it all the way down or I'll lose that texture. And then there's a little chain, a little print in place chain that hangs off here. It had actually broke off when I was removing supports, but I'm actually gonna try to go and get a real metal chain link in here. Um, I think it'll just add to the effect. So I just smoothed that down and you know we can fix that so let's get this in the paint booth and we'll uh, start priming it We got the first coat on and it's looking pretty good actually. Uh, there's gonna be a lot less touch up than I thought, believe it or not. But you can see, you know, how it's already, you can tell that it's got concave. That'll be super easy to fill. Um, really aren't too many layer lines left on this. I, I guess I sanded the bottom of the blade a lot better than the top. There's still a little bit peeking up through here. And you can actually see I had a little bit of under extrusion at some points. So that's gonna be interesting to fill in. Um, that filled in pretty nicely. There's not too much of a gap there, but then here you can see there still needs to be a little bit of love. And uh, I'm still playing with ideas on exactly how to fill that in, but we'll get there. So that shouldn't be too hard. So this looks pretty good. Um, you can actually already see it drying. Like this is already actually pretty dry to the touch. Um, this stuff is great. So we'll let this dry and maybe I'll do another coat and then flip it over. And I still have a very good amount of the can left. I, I will be able to do this whole blade probably two coats with just this one can. So that's kind of where the build footage ends, guys. Um, I, like I said in the beginning, I kind of just went through and made this thing. Um, I, I rinsed and repeated, like I said, I was sanding it and I was priming it. I sanded it and I primed it, I sanded it and I primed it, and I filled it as much as possible. And unfortunately, 
if I was out in any other lighting situation, if I was down in the garage, if I was downstairs, this light right here in my camera really, really, really amplifies the, uh, the seams and I can't see any of the seams. No matter really how I hold this, this blade looks great. But looking at it in the camera and looking at it on the TV right now, I can pretty much point to almost every single one and it's a little annoying. It's gonna make it a little bit annoying to film. I'm gonna be honest, it's not my absolute best work and I think eventually I am gonna go strip down the paint again and try to get it a much uh, glossier uh, or more reflective coating. But I am very happy with it. It is still just an absolutely intimidating prop and I said my mirror uh, that I think is just really cool to have and I I'm glad I built it. It was painted with just a generic black spray paint and then what I did is I went over it with this Rust-Oleum Oil Rub Bronze to give it a little bit of a sheen to it. Actually very similar to how I did my Buster Sword. And this was a Chrome Rust-Oleum. Now I didn't actually go uh, spend the time wet sanding with black and taking all the time in the world to get this nice and shiny and glossy because even in the anime it was never this beautiful shiny metallic sword. It wasn't this really, it's, it's a hunk of iron, you know, it's this big chunking beefy hunk of metal and I think I still am going to go add some cuts, add some chops, I still want to dirty this up and that's actually going to help hide a lot of little crimes and imperfections all over the blade. Um, the sky is really the limit with this and then I took it a one step farther and I actually wanted to get the handle a little bit more accurate. This is just an old pillowcase I cut up, you know, you can have a little bit of fun with props and you know uh, cosplay. Um, and I have some fake uh, vampire blood, I don't know why I had it, it was probably from a few Halloweens ago. But I actually went through, dirtied it up, and unfortunately, it didn't stick to the paint as well as I wanted it to. I'm still gonna experiment with that, and what I want is half of the blade, one side to be all bloody and dirty, kind of like it is in the anime, and then the other side will be a little bit more presentable. So it'll kind of be a little bit of a dual weapon for photo shoots or whatever I want to do with this. Um, I do wish I was taller. This way I could actually do maybe a uh, Guts cosplay. Um, I, we both have black hair, but I am nowhere near his height or his size. That'd be kind of cool. After everything was said and done and assembled, I did go through and insert the metal rod and, and if I shake it just right, you can hear it wobble around in there because like I said, the dimensional accuracy was off when I scaled this up to 110%. Now I can go and pop this handle back off, take the rod out, maybe add some duct tape, really beef up the, uh, the metal dowel or metal rod that's in there, stick it back down. But right now, I really can't be bothered. Uh, I will again fix it one day, but for the sake of the video, I'm pretty happy with it. I don't want to spend this video teaching you guys how to sand again, I have a video for that. How to plastic weld again, I have a video for that. Um, hopefully I've been able to teach you guys all the little bits and tricks you need to assemble this. We've gone over painting, we've gone over, we've gone over all of that stuff. I wanted to show you more what the final model looks like in case you guys might be interested in actually building it, where to get it, and how I kind of arrange the prints. Um, again, this is just a really cool blade. You can scale it down for a little bit more uh, ease of accessibility. Um, I don't know if I'm ever actually gonna bring this, anything, this thing anywhere, but it's still pretty cool to have. Here's the next to my Buster Sword for a little bit of a uh, uh, comparison. Um, having both of these is kind of cool and fun, and uh, I'm glad I made both of them. Um, I'm a big Final Fantasy fan. If you guys want to see how this Buster Sword was made, I do have a build video on this. It's a little bit more in depth than uh, the Dragon Slayer, so you can kind of combine the techniques that were you know, used in the Buster Sword as opposed to this, and kind of bounce the ideas off of each other. Again, there's a metal rod inside this one too, because what's a Buster Sword if you can't carry or you know, wield it? That kind of just about does it for this video, guys. I hope that gave you enough insight into building a larger weapon or a larger prop like this. If you guys want to learn a little bit more about building these bigger weapons and more in-depth techniques that go into it, I did just recently do a live video. It's called Building Big Ass Props and Big Ass Weapons. So you can go check that out. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty nice live stream kind of covering all the little ideas and tricks for making these and some welding techniques that are aren't covered in some of the other tutorials. So you guys can go give that a watch. Um, there's a lot of information in it. Uh, I've got some pretty good feedback from it. If you guys haven't already, if you could subscribe, that'd be really cool. Um, I have a lot of these little one-off weapons I'm still trying to make. I am working towards making Cloud's Fusion Sword from Advent Children. Um, I'm always down to make these big, just overly grotesque sized weapons. So if you guys have any suggestions, maybe kick them out in the comments. I'd really love to hear some other ideas for maybe some animes I've never heard of. Um, I've already gotten some suggestions from weapons from Bleach, Seven Deadly Sins, uh, animes like that. So if you guys have any other suggestions, I'd really love to hear them. If you guys want to interact more with the 3D printing and cosplay community and just meet other like-minded people, 
from noobs to beginners and people who have been doing this way longer than me and who are way better at this, please check the check out for the Discord link down below. It's a completely free community Discord and it's over 700 members now. It's a beautiful place to be. There's tons of friendly people who do all the same stuff and none of this stuff. So it's a really good dynamic um, to bounce ideas and learn and share and teach each other. So please go check that out, guys. Again, thank you so much for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, this is just so much fun making these things and uh, hopefully teaching you guys how to do it along the way. I really appreciate it and have a good day. And I'd be lying if I said it wasn't really cool to hold both of these at the same time.